floor over to my colleague, Brad DeLong. He is a professor of economics here at UC Berkeley. He is a deputy assistant uh, secretary of economic policy at the US Treasury. And he uh, serves as research associate for the National Bureau of Economic Research. And he's the first chief, chief economist of the Blum Center for Developing Economies. Brad. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me follow the example of our Lord and Master AlphaGo and take the high ground, the hyper-Olympian and very long-run historical point of view. The human brain is a massively parallel supercomputer that fits inside half a shoebox and draws 50 watts of power. It is an amazing innovation analysis and creation machine. 600 million years of proto-mammalian and mammalian evolution coupled with a genetic algorithm mean that almost every single human can solve AI problems that are far beyond our current reach. So much so that what our machines find impossible, our brains find so trivially easy that we call such capabilities, quote, unskilled, unquote. That's our brains. Human fingers are amazingly fine manipulation devices. Human back and leg muscles, especially when testosterone soaked, are quite good at moving heavy objects. And so back in the environment of evolutionary adaptation, we used our brains, our big muscles, and our fingers to lead interesting, if stressful, and short lives. But history has rolled forward. As history has rolled forward over the past 50 or 70,000 years or so, we have done other things to add economic and sociological value than use our backs, our fingers, and our brains. Over the long historical sweep, backs and fingers have declined, and we have turned many of us into, instead, robots ourselves, performing simple, routinized, repetitive tasks as microcontrollers for domesticated animals and machines, as relatively simple accounting and software bots keeping track of stuff and information, as personal servitors, and as social engineers trying to keep all those people and all those things controlled by brains, um, especially perhaps trying to keep all those controlled by the most testosterone-soaked ones, working together harmoniously, but with limited success, while remaining innovators, analyzers, and creators as well. Now, Bax started to go out with the domestication of the horse. Fingers, fingers with the invention of the spinning jenny. But microcontrollers, accounting bot paper shufflers, and humans as robots we cannot yet build took up all the job slack. Every horse needs a microcontroller, and a human brain is the only possible one, even today, to a large amount. Every textile machine needs a human watching it at least part of the time because it doesn't know when it's gone wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But now, um, now we can finally peer into a future in which the microcontrollers and the accounting bots are on their way out too. And so fortunately are the jobs that, teach, that treat humans as simple robots. Being a cog in the machine that is Henry Ford's River Rouge assembly line is an occupation that vastly, vastly underuses the human brain and its capabilities. It's not really a human job at all. So that leaves us with a future of work made up of us as personal servitors, as social engineers, as innovators, analyzers, and creators. And here we have some problems, right? That is, the market economy will amply fund AI that replaces workers in capital-intensive production processes um, by machines. Such are large scale, such are oligopolies. Oligopolistic firms profit from such R&D because they capture a large share themselves of the improvements in efficiency in their complicated value chains. And there is no equivalent market force funding AI that assists and amplifies workers in labor-intensive production processes. The first, shedding workers in capital-intensive production processes because of AI is absolute poison for equity and for equitable growth. The second, amplifying the capabilities of workers in labor-intensive production processes is gold. Utopia or dystopia, heaven or hell, 
over to you. Um, and in that you, I primarily include Shankar Sastry. <laughs> because firms will not invest on a large scale in AI that amplifies the capabilities of labor in labor-intensive industries. They will focus on the capital-intensive oligopolies. But NGOs, like an engineering school, like an engineering school at a public university, they can act differently. So over to you. And let me stop there.